Hi everyone, this is Rob Lashley with MMORPG.com. Today I have with me Ryan Dancy, CEO of Goblin Works Entertainment. Ryan? Hi everybody, it's Ryan. Glad to be here. So, in case you've been under a rock for the last few months, you've probably noticed that they just successfully had a uh, Kickstarter campaign and they eclipsed the one million needed to launch into production or development of Pathfinder Online. Ryan, you want to talk a little bit about the challenges you guys faced with the, uh, I, not just the one, I guess, but the two different Kickstarters you guys have done at this point? Yeah, we we have kind of an unusual project. We've run two successful Kickstarters, which I don't think too many people have done so far. We ran our first Kickstarter last summer to finance the development of what we call the technology demo. And the tech demo is a vertical slice of the core components of the MMO, but it's not really a fully playable game. It's more of a demonstration project, so we can take the whole company to an investor and say, look, we have guys on staff that can incredibly do this work, and here's a piece of technology we built that shows we can do the client side, the server side, the 3D asset pipeline, the uh, programming for the network layer, uh, basically all the components that we need to be able to demonstrate we can do to, to make an MMO. We asked for fifty thousand dollars in that Kickstarter. We raised three hundred and seven thousand, uh, which was great because the final cost of the project was about three hundred twenty thousand. So it worked out just right. And then, uh, starting uh, right in the end of November, we launched a second Kickstarter. This time to increase the speed and scope of the actual MMO itself, the Pathfinder Online MMO project we ran on Kickstarter. And we asked for a million dollars in that Kickstarter, and we raised just over a million. We got uh, one million ninety thousand. Um, which was awesome, and uh, as a result of that, we've been able to shave almost a year off of our design timeline for the project. Okay, so that year, I guess it was originally scheduled that you guys were going to have Pathfinder online to the people at 2016, so you've actually been able to reduce that back down to 2015? Yeah, we're, we're, we're basically, what we're going to do is, we're going to have a period of play that we call early enrollment, and that will be followed with a more traditional release. And both of those timelines, the early enrollment timeline and the release timeline, have both been moved up by a year. So we went from uh, a design that in anticipated uh, four or five years to a d design that will take about three years in total to implement. Okay, so you want to talk a little bit about the genesis of Pathfinder Online? Where did the idea for you guys to say, you know what, let's take the Pathfinder core rule set and turn this into an MMO? Sure. Uh, I used to work at Wizards of the Coast. I was the vice president of uh, tabletop role-playing games and the Dungeons and Dragons brand manager. And on my team, I had a person named Lisa Stevens. Lisa was the first paid employee at Wizards of the Coast, and she was also one of the first employees at White Wolf. Uh, we both left Wizards um, after 2000, and uh, Lisa started a company called Paizo Publishing. And a couple of years after she started that company, they uh, decided that they were going to create their own tabletop RPG, which they called Pathfinder. Um, and during the time that she was building Paizo, I was uh, running a couple of startup companies and I ended up working as the chief marketing officer at CCP, the company that makes EVE Online. I left CCP at the end of 2010 and Lisa was one of the first people I called to talk to about uh, new opportunities. Um, she and I are pretty good friends and we'd always been looking for an opportunity to work together. And I asked if she had had a plan for what to do with Pathfinder in the MMO space. And the response was that they had no plan and didn't really understand that space much at all. Uh, and would I be willing to come to Paizo and kind of give them a kind of a top level executive summary on the business and how it worked and what the costs and risks and opportunities were? So I did that, and uh, the Paizo team was pretty excited by the by the idea, and I was pretty excited by the opportunity to work with them and work with Pathfinder, which I think is a really great brand. So in uh, 2011, we spent a bunch of time working on how to do it and what kind of game to make and what should the financial envelope look like. Uh, and near the end of 2011, uh, Paizo was satisfied with that work and we greenlit the project and we've been working on it since basically the uh, end of 2011. Okay. What's one of the key ingredients in the Pathfinder universe that's going to separate this MMO from other traditional MMOs that are already out there that are in a high fantasy setting? Well, the most important thing about Pathfinder Online is that it's a, it's a sandbox. Uh, we visualize the MMO space as having two major branches, theme parks and sandboxes. Most of the games that uh, your listeners are familiar with are theme park games. Uh, World of Warcraft is a theme park game, and most of the big AAA high-profile MMOs that have been released over the past five or six years are all theme park games. 
Um, in a theme park game, the player's primary mode of interaction is between the character and the environment. The, the character goes through a series of custom-built, uh, pre-scripted experiences that are built by the developers, and the persistence that that character has in the world is usually very limited. They might be able to craft a few items, and maybe they can make a structure or two, but by and large, the game world is built and maintained by the development team, and the players experience it. In a sandbox game, the primary mode of interaction is between the players. And uh, at Goblinworks, our biggest design paradigm is maximizing meaningful human interaction. So in the sandbox, instead of creating a bunch of pre-scripted adventures or dungeons or quests or raids, what we want to do is build tools that let the player characters interact with each other in interesting and meaningful ways. Uh, there aren't very many sandbox games out there. One of the first MMOs, Ultima Online, began life as a sandbox, and it's still pretty sandboxy. And uh, at, when I worked, worked at CCP, I worked on EVE Online, and EVE is probably the most successful sandbox, science fiction sandbox. Uh, EVE started with around uh, 20,000 players, and it currently has a global audience of about 450,000. Yeah, I don't even so, think you had to specify science fiction. I think Eve's got to be one of. <laughs> it has yeah. to be like probably the most popular sandbox MMO out there. Yeah, exactly. So you know we have that going for us that we, we're going to be in a, a fairly uncrowded segment of the market. Um, the Pathfinder brand itself is actually a, a huge asset as well. It has its roots all the way back to the birth of the tabletop RPG hobby. It's essentially a descendant of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, through a licensing regime that we created when we were at Wizards of the Coast. Um, so people who play D&D or people who play Pathfinder will find the mechanics of the online game to be very similar. We're not going to use a direct port of the tabletop game, but we're going to use mechanics that are inspired by the tabletop experience. People who know what spells do in the tabletop game will know what those spells do in the online game. And people who know what various character abilities do in the tabletop game, we'll find that they do similar things in the online game. So there's a really close uh, cohesion between the, the two experiences. Um, the Pathfinder brand, which sits on top of the game mechanics, is a really rich and robust world called Galarian. It's custom built by Paizo. Um, it has elements in it that are drawn from all sorts of sub-genres inside of fantasy literature. So in the world of Galarian, there is a home for Conan and for Arthurian myths and for Egyptian content and kingdoms run by vampires and places where alien spaceships have crashed and there's this weird mixture of natural technology. If you can imagine it, it's, it's in the Pathfinder world. And we have chosen an area of that world which is a place where characters from all over the planet could potentially find themselves passing through or living in. So we have a built-in reason to be able to mix a lot of that great content from the whole world of Galarian uh, into the area that we're going to use just for the MMO. What area, because um, it, it looks like you guys are even going so far as there's a, a source manual that's going to come out for the, the pen and paper game as well that you're going to focus Pathfinder on at the beginning. Right. There's an area each. So the world of Galarian, the, the home world of Pathfinder, is divided into essentially nations or regions. And each of those regions has a theme. And the region that we're setting the online game in is called the River Kingdoms. And the River Kingdoms was actually designed to be a fantasy sandbox for tabletop role-playing game players. Uh, it's an area of the world that is not controlled by any sovereign nation. There is no uh, overall control of the land. It's broken up into dozens or hundreds of small kingdoms. And it's a place where people could go, and if they're strong enough, they can uh, pitch a flag and build a fort and claim to be kings. Um, so it has this very sandboxy element already built into it. Um, we are going to begin the game in a small corner of the River Kingdoms that we call the Crusader Road. And the backstory is that in the far north of the world, a rift has opened between the world of Galarian and the infernal realms of, of hell. And demonic creatures are attempting to invade the world at this location. It's called the World Wound. The River Kingdoms has a series of rivers that run through it north-south. And one of those rivers is a major transportation link for people that are assembling elsewhere in Galarian, in the area called the Inner Sea, to travel north and fight this demonic incursion. 
So we're putting our game, we're starting our game in a place where crusaders and their camp followers and the people that are traveling with them and opposing them or supporting them are all moving through on a regular basis, um, which gives us a really great dynamic um, experience for the players. They're going to have an opportunity to play characters from all over the game world, and we'll have an opportunity to use elements of the game world throughout our MMO, even though geographically we're located in a very small corner of that world. Okay. Uh, one of the things I'm doing right now is I'm looping the uh, crowd forging video you guys had out there with the Kickstarter. Do you want to talk a little bit about the whole concept and idea behind crowd forging? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is really a key part of our entire design process, and it was a big part of our Kickstarter. Uh, we think that w there's a unique opportunity right now to engage with our community in a way that other MMOs haven't had the chance to do or haven't wanted to do. And that idea is that as we develop the game, we want to have the players involved at every step of the way, giving us their feedback and participating in the decisions about how features get prioritized and what kinds of uh, things we put into the game and what order we put them into the game. Because building a sandbox focuses primarily on tools as opposed to content, we need to make sure that those players are as engaged as possible as we're building those tools so they can help us make that game work best for them as well as work best according to our vision of what the game should be. So we want to take this idea of community feedback kind of to the next level. Uh, CCP does a great job with what they call the Council of Stellar Management, which is a player elected body that consults directly with the development team a couple times a year. Uh, we're going to do stuff like that, but we're also going to look for as many other opportunities as we can to get the players involved in making really key decisions about how the game gets built. Uh, we think that experience is going to be a unique and really special experience for everybody who's involved in it. Um, and it's one of the highlights of our Kickstarter. The people who pledged at a certain level or above are going to be in the game during the period we call early enrollment. And that's the period of the time in the development process when a lot of the basic game systems will be implemented and, and put in the game. So those players will have the sense of actually helping craft the game right alongside of us. Any t I know that you guys were talking about accelerating the timeline on when the game was developed based on the success of the Kickstarter. Is there any time frame on when players could actually start to see that early enrollment period begin? Yeah, our current target is to begin early enrollment in the summer of 2014. Okay. So do you guys have thoughts? Well, obviously you have thoughts, but what do you guys feel about like crafting? Uh, a lot of times nowadays MMOs have become paint by numbers and it's like crafting. You got to have it in there because people like to do it but it usually ends up not being worth people's time in the long run because it's never as good as things that you can find in other PvE encounters. How does crafting play into a game that's a sandbox like this? Right off the bat, I can say that almost everything in the game is going to be crafted by player characters. You're not going to recover the, the items that you would use um, in the game as loot dropped from killing mobs you're going to recover crafting resources from loot dropped from mobs. And you'll have to find crafters to take that stuff and make usable items out of it. So we want to move crafting right into the center of the heart of the game design. Uh, our economic system as a whole is really the, the, the fundamental point around which we build the game. The whole idea that you're going to be making the things that people use the things people consume, the buildings that they live in, the vehicles they use to transport material from place to place, all that stuff gets built as a part of the economy, and therefore crafting is just a hugely important part of the whole game. Okay. Uh, another thing with sandboxes is PvP. Uh, but I do know there's a certain portion of people that are concerned that are used to theme parks where there's PV, you know, PvP safe areas for a large portion. Uh, do you guys have plans in place to kind of keep down on what players would consider the ganking and, you know, the unnecessary PvP as opposed to, hey, my faction's at war with yours, let's have a legitimate reason to have combat as opposed to, oh, you're a new player, let me kill you and make this a terrible experience for you. Yeah, absolutely we do. Uh, my personal opinion is that PvP is kind of the original sin of the MMO space. It was, it's an obvious and interesting element of meaningful human interaction. But because some of the games that were early in the space 
ended up with fairly bad experiences from PvP, the industry as a whole has tended to minimize and downplay PvP. Uh, most of the theme park games that are available today, they kind of shunt PvP off into arenas. They, they create a segregated experience, so you, you only experience it, you only are a part of PvP if that's a, some, an element of the game that you choose to pursue. It doesn't really affect the rest of the game design. Uh, but in a sandbox game, we don't want to exclude people from any area of the game. We want the game to kind of come to them organically. So PvP is something that's going to be prevalent throughout the whole game world. Wherever you go, there'll be an opportunity to participate in PvP, kind of whether you like it or not. There will be some safe zones. There will be some places, especially for new characters, where they can learn how to play the game without feeling threatened. Uh, and we're going to have a security system similar to what they have in EVE, where certain NPC-controlled settlements and certain PC-controlled settlements will be able to uh, mandate that uh, engaging in PvP outside of certain limits is not acceptable, and there will be repercussions for doing that. Um, you know, my, my approach is that there's no magic bullet to dealing with griefing and, and, and the, the sense that uh, some people don't like PvP and some people like it too much. What you have to do is you have to approach the problem from the standpoint of saying that you're going to have a multi-layered system that has lots of checks and balances, and it has to be multi-dimensional. It has to work both inside the game mechanically and outside of the game socially. And then overall, there has to be a commitment on the part of the company, on the part of Goblinworks in this case, to ensure that the community is protected against people that want to take advantage of it and kind of ruin their fun uh, just for the sake of ruining their fun. You know, we have a really simple rule. Don't be a jerk. And, uh, you know, the definition of what is a jerk is uh, in our eyes. And uh, it's, it's a community-based feeling. So um, people are going to learn that there are boundaries. And those boundaries will have some gray areas and they'll be flexible. Uh, but I think that people will come to find that if we're successful with our design and with the way we want to manage our community, we can return PvP to the MMO world in a way that's fun and engaging and adds a lot of value to the experience and isn't just a huge negative that ruins the game for everybody. Okay. Um, another thing that, you know, is part of the MMO experience is the character creation system. Uh, you know, it would obviously be probably pretty hard to just say, hey, this is how they do it in the book. This is exactly the way we're going to do it in an MMO. Uh, how do you imagine taking the character creation process, which is unique to Pathfinder, and creating that in Pathfinder Online? Well, we're going to do a lot of things differently when it comes to the way characters develop over time in the online game than what happens on the tabletop game. Uh, and that's basically by necessity. Uh, there are legal complications with using the game rules from the tabletop game, but there's also game design complications. That game is designed to be played in a different way than an online game is played. It's, it's an episodic thing where you get together for a couple of hours, you know, once or twice a week or once or twice a month, and real time is not connected to game time, so players can take an essentially unlimited amount of real time to decide what they want to do. Uh, it has no impact on what's happening in game time. But in the online experience, everything happens in real time. And there will be people who will log in on the first day and you know, not log out until the day they die. And so you have to build a game around you know, those assumptions. It's a, That's hardcore. It is hardcore. But uh, I know they're out there. So <laughs> oh, I'm sure they are. <laughs> so uh, two things we're going to do. The first thing is uh, we're going to borrow a page from the, uh, from the EVE game design. And we're going to have a system of real-time skill training. Uh, in EVE, when, you, uh, when your character is training skills, every time you reach a certain threshold, uh, your character may gain a mechanical benefit from training that skill. And we're going to not have very much of that in Pathfinder Online. Instead, in Pathfinder Online, skill training is going to be more of a prerequisite that will enable you to unlock the opportunity to get uh, an additional character ability. Uh, we, we pair the skill training system with in-game activities, uh, which we currently call merit badges, although I don't really like that term, and we're <laughs> going to change it. Um, achievements, you know, mm -hmm. something, like, something like that. But the idea basically being that you train, uh, your character trains, uh, maybe uh, as an example, uh, you know, fighting with a longsword. And you reach a certain level, and then in the game, when you kill ten orcs, if you've also trained you know, fighting with a longsword to the first level, killing 10 orcs gives you a merit badge, and that unlocks the character ability of you know, better fighting with swords. So 
that kind of leads into my second issue, which is in the tabletop game, your character gains experience, and when you hit an experience level threshold, you level up and you get a whole package of character benefits. And in Pathfinder Online, we're going to invert that system. What's going to happen in Pathfinder Online is that as you're training these skills and earning these merit badges and unlocking these character abilities, at certain points, we're going to recognize that and say, ah, okay, you have advanced down a path, and we're going to commemorate that by saying, you're now uh, you know, level one in fighter, or level one in rogue, or level 15 in cleric, or whatever. So instead of earning experience points and then getting a level and then getting a bunch of benefits, you're going to get a bunch of benefits and then be rewarded for doing that by earning the level. So characters will find, players will find, that they have lots of room to make really unique and distinct characters by training lots of skills and earning lots of merit badges. And some of those things will contribute to them getting recognition for advancing down a, a class path, down a role path. But instead of saying a class is a narrow straitjacket, and you have to follow it in order to do anything, we're basically saying getting levels in a class in Pathfinder Online is recognizing what you're already doing. And as long as you keep doing that stuff, we'll keep recognizing you. But if you go and you do something that's really unique that we didn't anticipate in the game design, that's perfectly okay. Your character is going to continue to gain abilities. You're not going to be limited uh, in doing what you want to do just because we have said that certain things are recognizable as classes. Um, and we're doing that not just to kind of capture the class history from Pathfinder Tabletop, but we also recognize that in an online game, the careers that characters are going to pursue are much more diverse than they are in the Tabletop game. And instead of trying to come up with a class for Diplomat or Spy or Wagon Driver or any of a hundred other things that players will do in the online game, we're going to have just a really robust skill system that will let them find their way to doing all those different careers without us having to invent them in advance of the players figuring them out. Okay. Um, one of the problems that we see in modern MMOs, especially in the theme parks, is people get to the level cap, and then the game completely changes. You know, you've got this really interesting game that goes one through whatever arbitrary number they put at the end, and then you have a completely different game when you hit that arbitrary number. Um, when will the quote-unquote endgame and Pathfinder begin, or will there even really be an endgame? There really won't be an endgame. The, 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 um, the background of the game is territorial conflict between player-run settlements. And those settlements will grow over time in complexity as well as numbers, and the territory that they're able to take control of and manage will grow over time. So the idea that you and your friends form a settlement and you carve your own little kingdom out of the wilderness and then you have to defend it, that is the basic gameplay. And as the game grows larger and gets more players, we'll just iterate continuously on that mechanic, continuing to make it interesting and add more tools and more ways to players to, to kind of meaningfully interact between settlements as well as between each other. Um, but there's not going to be a point where you have to completely transform what you're doing from one style of play to a different style of play just because you ran out of content. Okay, uh, and back on characters, can I, will there be like a cap to the things that people can learn? Could I be Rob the Swordsman, Rob the Cobbler, Rob the Blacksmith, Rob the guy that likes to drive his own wagon from town to town sometimes? Or will I have to log off and make another person and be like, Rob ba, 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 the Blacksmith and Rob ba, 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 the Cobbler? So uh, my answer is that you'll, you could become Rob all of those things but likely you will want to have Rob 1, Rob 2, and Rob 3. Okay. And so the reason is that because a component of your character's advancement is based on real-time passing, mm -hmm. the more real-time that you dedicate to maximizing your uh, effectiveness in any one area is going to be offset by uh, any distractions, any, any side paths that you take to kind of diversify your character. So it will be certainly possible to try to become good at lots of things in parallel, it will just take a very long time. But if you specialize in one thing and become really good at that, you'll be able to become as good as anybody else in the game at that one thing relatively quickly. So it's kind of a catch-up mechanic. It doesn't matter when you start the game. If you want to be a certain thing, after a reasonable amount of time, you'll be as good at that thing as the guy who started on the very first day. The difference is that the guy who started on the very first day 
has had the time to be thing one, thing two, and thing three, whereas you're probably only going to be thing one. Okay. So there will be a sense of, you know, logging your character off, and he's still, like, digesting the the experiences that he's had and, and leveling. And while he, he's doing that, you could be playing another character and doing something completely different. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um Another thing I want to talk about with the sandbox concept is that you're going to have like open dungeon areas for exploration, I guess. And what happens when my group clears a dungeon and kills, you know, the big bad? I mean, does everybody that comes behind me is just, you know, they're out of luck? <laughs> right. Yeah, sorry. Limited amount of content when it's all consumed, it's gone. Yeah. Now, uh, what will happen is that a lot of that material will either be procedurally generated mm -hmm. or it will be templated. So it will be... Uh, It'll be uh, created on the fly by the system from some prefabricated components. Um, and what you'll find is that uh, being a, a, an adventuring character, the kind of character that engages primarily with PvE content, um, is, is, is challenging but not diverse. Uh, you'll see the same kinds of content often, and the amount of diversity in that content will be a function of how many players we have in the game and how large the game is getting. So in the beginning, there won't be very much, but as time passes and as the game and the business gets bigger, we'll be able to invest in more of that content and it'll get more diverse. Uh, Do you see room for player-generated content down the road as far as, you know, giving them a DM, you know, for, I guess, maybe it's not correct to call it a dungeon master toolkit you know because that'd be wizards of the coast but anyways a, a tool set like that to where i could create my own adventures for my players and for my friends yeah we we totally do uh, you know we see the let me let me clarify we see that opportunity and we think that would be awesome okay uh, the ability to deliver that toolkit is very much a function of time and resources and prioritization uh, but we have this idea that um, eventually, at some point down the road, um, we would be able to create an experience, uh, an environment where you would be able to create uh, PVE content, dungeons, um, and actually sell them on like a dungeon store, like an app store. So other people could purchase access to them and play through that content, and we would split the proceeds of that money with the people who created it. Uh, but like I said, that's a long way down the road. So. Mm -hmm. Take that as a, a, a future thing, uh, not, a, not a feature of the game when it gets uh, immediately released. Understood. Uh, another thing with the Pathfinder universe, it's my understanding that you know, magic is very strong. And I think one of the things that people have take licensed properties of you know, Dungeons & Dragons in the past, uh, where magic, again, is very strong, is they've had a very challenging time of iterating that into the game successfully. Uh, what do you guys plan on doing to make sure that magic is pretty well balanced and they're not just, you know, slaying all melee characters out there? Right. Well, when, when we were working on third edition of Dungeons & Dragons, the designers decided that they wanted to mentally divide that game into four different types of uh, character experience. So the first five levels are kind of um, the experience you get when you're a raw rookie, and the world is very dangerous, uh, and falling down a pit can kill you, and getting bit by a spider can kill you, and lots of things can kill you. Your characters are very fragile. And then um, the second five levels, from level 6 to 10, you're a heroic adventurer. Your, your character is able to take a couple of shots and keep on fighting. You're starting to expand the kind of resources that you've got access to, and you are beginning to unlock the interesting parts of the class archetypes. So the characters are beginning to differentiate themselves uh, nicely. They all take on different roles within a party, and they do different things. Beyond that point, beyond 10th level, the characters are more like superheroes, and then they become more like demigods. So we're going to focus Pathfinder Online in that, in that power zone between 6th and 10th level. There will be a period of time as a new character when you'll be relatively fragile, but that period is mostly for learning how to play the game. It's not a period of time that we expect people to spend many, many, many hours in. It's, it's more of a tutorial type experience. Um, and then there will be essentially a hard cap on how powerful characters can get to keep the power level within that, roughly within that range of 6th to 10th level. Um, and when we look at the magic items and the magic spells that are appropriate for those uh, level characters, we don't find a lot that is really destabilizing and really dangerous. Uh, there are definitely some powerful spells in there and definitely some powerful magic items, and they'll have to be carefully balanced. But 
we're, we're not reaching into the really high level power of and reality altering and planner travel, uh, perfect knowledge through clairvoyance and the ability. If I got alien spaceships wrecking, why can't I be clairvoyant or <laughs> interdimensional travel? Well, that's a great point. There's a, there's a certain opportunity for you to be able to see more than your human senses can perceive. But mm -hmm. we also don't want a game where you instantly know the location of any character at any time and can teleport directly to that person without error freeze that person in place, and then strike them with a holy bolt of power uh, before they can do anything. That's not much of a fun game. <laughs> yeah, that really wouldn't work out too well, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, okay. Um, oh, I had another question for you there, and I, I lost it. Oh, one of the debates that's been kind of raging on the MMORPG.com forums lately has been tutorials and the value of them. You know, there are some games from the theme parks, it's like, come on, I've played this game like ten times already. This is just a new iteration. You've slapped some new paint. It, basically, it's the same thing. I don't really need a tutorial. Uh, but with Pathfinder being a sandbox, and we do have a very large sandbox community, but I think that you'll probably pull a lot of people in that are new to this genre. How, how vast do you have to envision the tutorial being to bring them up to speed so they can kind of understand what's really going on? Well... One of the lessons I learned at CCP is the critical experience of uh, what CCP calls the new player experience. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily just a tutorial. It's a, a whole armada of information that you need to get into the hands of the player in a meaningful way without overwhelming them with minutia. And that's an incredibly challenging balancing act. Um, so when we look at our new player experience, we're going to be very careful to, um, to present it in a way that players can skip it if they don't need it, if they've already played the game before and it's not going to be helpful to them. Um, or if they're interested in a certain aspect of the game, they can get a lot of information about that thing without having to get distracted by a lot of other stuff. So if the character wants to be a crafter, we want to make it really easy to learn how to be a crafter without also having to learn how to be a warrior or a teamster. Uh, but there's also a lot of kind of how do you play a sandbox game material that we need to present. Um, I really like the approach that many of the Rockstar games take. I especially like the approach that they took in Red Dead Redemption, um, where you really get a tremendous amount of information about how to play that game and how to find interesting things to do and kind of self-direct your character's experience without feeling like you've been put on rails and you're just taken from A to B to C. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of really good learning there that we're going to study and dissect and, and bring into Pathfinder Online. Um, I think one of the challenges that the players can get into in, in, a, in a sandbox game very quickly is they just don't know what to do next. It, if you give somebody an open world and say, go have fun, a lot of people get frozen at the door and they just don't know what to do. Yeah. Um, so we don't want to basically say to them, this is what you have to do. But what we'd really like to do is come up with a way to give people objectives for things they could be doing. So if they can't figure out what else they should be doing, they could be doing this thing that seems obvious to do. Um, and my experience is that is a great way to kind of bridge that gap between the world's open and here's some things you should learn how to do before you get lost. Okay. Uh, technologically, the game for the demo you guys had running on the Unity engine, and it kind of seemed very browser-based. Uh, is that something that you guys actually plan on going forth with the game, or is that just to show people what the world of Pathfinder was kind of envisioned as and give some kind of artistic styles to begin with? So uh, basically we've shown people two things. The technology demo itself was built on the big world middleware. And um, we weren't able to use that middleware to build the game, so we had to change platforms and switch to Unity. And uh, we, we didn't want to rebuild the whole tech demo in Unity. We're, we're going to take those, uh, that, those manpower hours and spend them actually working on the game as opposed to working on the tech demo. But what we did do is we took the environment that we built for the tech demo and we brought it into Unity so that we could show people the difference between the tech demo video that they saw, which was Big World, and a live running instance uh, in Unity using Unity's rendering engine. And we were able to make that available as a web-based, uh, what we call the environmental experience. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really represent the way the game will be played. The game's not going to be played in a browser. It's going to be a client game like the PC or Mac. Um, and there's nothing in the environment experience except trees and rocks and 
and a, a dungeon. Uh, there's no animated characters. There's no monsters. Um, so it's more just a way to show people, hey, we're making this jump to Unity. Um, by the way, we want you to see kind of what that looks like. Uh, because we're devoting our development resources to working on the game, we're not going to update the tech demo, but we can show you this thing that we could do relatively easily that makes you feel comfortable that the switch to the, the new tool is we're not going to lose anything we would have had with the old tool. Okay. Uh, in the end, the game is going to look... Um, it, it, the game, the art style of the game is heavily influenced by the art style of Pathfinder, the tabletop game. So we look at the really great covers that Wayne Reynolds has painted and a lot of the interiors that are in the Adventure Path books. And it has a certain art style that we really want to try and capture. And the closer we get to that art style in the, in the digital world, uh, I think the happier the Pathfinder fans will be. Uh, so what you kind of see both in the tech demo and in the environmental experience is very basic, very rapidly prototyped work, and it doesn't really represent at all what the graphic look will be for the game when it gets released. Okay, I know that's been a big thing, too, as people have looked at it and said, is this what the graphics are going to be like? Um, and they were kind of concerned about that, so it's good to know that this, this isn't what the final product is going to look like. Yeah, we built the tech demo in 90 days. And, <laughs> it's pretty quick. Uh, about half of that time was spent working on a variety of different middleware engines mm -hmm. just to decide which ones we like the best. So, um, you know, it, it may be difficult to understand if you're just a fan and you've never kind of been on, on the other side of the wall, but, um, you know, making graphics in a video game look good is not something that you do overnight or in a weekend. It takes months and months and months of really careful work um, and polishing and, and rework. Um, and so you don't get to a finished, high-quality graphic presentation for an MMO until you've spent a lot of time on the product. Um, and th that wasn't the purpose of the tech demo, and so we're actually really happy with the way the tech demo looks. So we think it looks fantastic, given the amount of time that we spent on it. I enjoy the concepts of it. It's just I we've seen feedback where people are we're kind of taken aback. Like I don't, this is going to be on 2016. I hope this is really not what this is going to look like. So it's good to know that to hear it from you that if that was one of your main concerns and keeping you from taking a look at Pathfinder, that you really don't have anything to worry about because it's going to be a little bit better than that. Yeah, absolutely. So. Okay, um, I've got a, people have been asking some questions here. If you don't mind, I'm going to go through sure. the chat go and see if anybody's got anything that we haven't asked already. Um, oh, something I wanted to ask real quick. Uh, one of the raging things right now is the whole monetization debate. And I know the game is, you know, four years, three and a half years before it's going to be released. Um, but you guys are going to have a period of subscription during the, the quote, I guess the beta process, the early entry process, where the people that will help shape and form the game will yeah. be charged a monthly subscription. Uh, what are you going to do once the game goes live? And before the early entry process, are you guys still looking for additional you know, investors, or what's going to get you from now to then? Because that, that's a, a million dollars is a lot of money, but when you're hi paying an entire staff for the next three years, it, you quickly see where it goes away. Yeah, that, that's a great question. That's actually two great questions. Uh, let me take them in the same order that you asked them. Okay. Uh, so the long-term business plan for Pathfinder Online is a hybrid, and we will have subscriptions and we will have microtransactions, similar to what Turbine has done with Lord of the Rings Online and with Dungeons & Dragons Online. So people who pay with a subscription will get a basic package of stuff that's meaningful to them in the game. And people who want to can buy the same things the subscribers are getting all a cart with microtransactions. Um, and there will be some things available for microtransactions that are mostly bling. They're just things to make your character look cool. Um, or they are minor consumable items that are provided for convenience. So there will be some things that people who are paying a subscription may still want to engage in microtransactions for. Mm -hmm. The theory there basically is there's a certain number of people in the world who don't want to or can't afford to pay a monthly subscription fee, but they'll pay something. Mm -hmm. So if you give them the opportunity to pay a la carte via microtransactions, they can find the amount of money that they want to spend on the game that's appropriate for them without being forced into a one-size-fits-all answer. And there are some people in the world for whom spending money on the game is really not an object, and they'll spend crazy amounts of money if we just let them. And so we want to create opportunities for those people to give us the money, um, and in turn, we want to give them some really cool stuff 
but we don't want the stuff we give them to be mechanically unbalancing. We mm -hmm. don't want people to feel like they can buy win. Uh, during early enrollment, we're going to begin early enrollment with just subscriptions because building the microtransaction system and the elements that go into microtransactions is the kind of thing that's going to happen during early enrollment. So sometime during early enrollment and before release, we'll be able to begin adding microtransactions, and when we get to release, both methods of payment will be available. And to your second question, uh, we're really fortunate in that the technology demo allowed us to secure financing to put the game into production. The Kickstarter enabled us to speed up the development plan. So the amount of money that's going to be spent on Pathfinder before we take in uh, the first dollar of money from subscribers in early enrollment is going to be a lot, many, many millions of dollars more than a million dollars. Mm -hmm. um, we are considering taking in additional investment, although we are not currently talking with anybody seriously about that. Um, taking in additional money would mean that we would be able to speed the game up and or enlarge the scope of what we can deliver during early enrollment and before we get to release. So we have to balance the interests of expanding the scope of the game with the need to deliver on the promises that we made to everybody who backed us in the Kickstarter. Um, but the good news is, is that the game is financed and we're, we're on a great production schedule that we think is, is achievable. So raising additional money is just better. It's not make or break. Well, that's a very great position to put you guys in because I know a lot of publishers would try to attach, you know, stipulations or, ah, we don't think that we want that in the game. And it's like, well, that's going to deviate from the whole foundation of what we wanted to do. It's like, eh, we want it out next year, so do that. Yeah, we have a really great advantage now because of the Kickstarter. Anybody who comes to us with that argument, we just point at the Kickstarter and say, yeah, we really can't do that. Yeah. Uh, we promised 8,000 people we would do a specific thing. They gave us a million dollars. They gave us a million dollars before you gave us anything. So we serve that master as opposed to serving a new master. That's great. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are really tired of big publishers making changes to the design ideas of games that they thought that they were supporting, and then it turns out to not be the game that they were hoping for. So sure. it's good to know that you guys aren't going to have to you know, feed that master. Well, um, we're independent. So, all right, let's see if there's any good ones in here. Uh, So I guess here's one. Uh, what do you guys plan on? Well, I, it's kind of a sandbox, so I think it inherently leads itself. But to encourage people to actually be role playing as opposed to just be in the game and like, hey, I'm Rob. What's going on, Bill? You know, what are we gonna do today? Uh, so uh, that's a great question, uh, and I guess I have a couple of different answers. Uh, the first answer is that in most theme park games, you don't really have a chance to play a role. What you're usually playing is a um, kind of predefined walking stat block uh, that's optimized for a very specific thing, you know, the, the Trinity concept. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're not a paladin or, or a barbarian or a ranger or a fighter. Uh, you're a guy who does DPS or tanks. Mm -hmm. um, not a lot of great role playing there. In the sandbox experience, what you do in the game is essentially role playing. So if you are robbing caravans, then you are role-playing being a highwayman. And if you are defending caravans from robbers, then you are role-playing a caravan guard. It happens organically as part of the way the game develops. But we're really sensitive also to the idea that we have a lot of fans who would like to uh, bring elements of the whole uh, Pathfinder world uh, into Pathfinder Online. They'd like to be have their characters be from a certain region or uh, express uh, allegiance to uh, pantheon of gods or to uh, transnational organizations. Um, and we want to enable that to the degree that we can. As with everything in Pathfinder Online, it will start small and grow larger over time. But we're really sensitive to the idea that somebody wants to be able to say, you know, my character is from this part of the world, and I'd like to have appropriate clothing and appropriate skin color and appropriate hair color and maybe an appropriate title uh, and possibly some relationship outside of the game to an NPC or an NPC organization that reflects my concept of where my character is from. Really want to enable a lot of that to happen. That's a, that really uh, brought to mind something that I noticed during the Kickstarter is that you rewarded backers at a certain level uh, with like 
you can be from a certain area, you can have a certain backstory. We're going to put this marker on a road, you know, that kind of, you know, (laughs) is in honor of you. Is there really going to be, is there going to be incentive for other players to go and find those markers to be like, hey, you know, this is pretty cool. This guy from did this and let's go hunt down the rest of them and and see where they're at. Just as kind of little Easter eggs. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll, there'll be more than Easter eggs, actually. I think that they may become uh, organically important to uh, to that whole concept about um, following a, a, a class archetype or a role. So, uh, you know, if, if you want to uh, become a great cleric, uh, it might become necessary for you to find all of the mementos in the game world that represent the deeds of famous clerics, as an example. Mm-hmm. So that would be one of the many things you might have to do on the road to, you know, gaining clerical power is uh, seek out the monuments and read the text and learn about those those people. Um, so yeah, I think it'll be a it'll be a big deal, uh, at least in a fun way. If it becomes onerous and if people are telling us they don't like it, yeah. you know, we, we always make changes. But uh, you know, I played a lot of City of Heroes, and uh, I really remember when the achievement system was first added to City of Heroes. And a big part of it was traveling through the zones and finding these little memorial plaques and learning about the backstory of City of Heroes. It was a lot of fun. I had a little checklist I kept next to my computer, and I was constantly trying to find these things so I could qualify for these various achievements. I think people get into it. It's, it's kind of like stamp collecting. They, there's a certain mentality of, I found five of these things. I know there's ten of them. I need to find the other five. Um, and that's fun. So it's, it's not like we're burdening people with something they don't want to do anyway. Yeah, I around those same ideas, the Tomb of Knowledge that was in Warhammer Online, I think was a, a pretty interesting idea. I don't know how well it ended up working out, but where it would open up and explain lore about different things based on objectives that you achieved. So, Yeah, I love that. I thought that was one of the best elements in that game. I think it's fantastic. That was probably my favorite feature of the game. That and the public quest. So. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. Um. Just trying to get through some of these. Some of them were like, "Will there be any discoverable items like rare magical swords or dragon slain?" But you know, I think we've kind of talked about most of it was going to be through crafting. But are we going to find one-offs like that that would make people want to go out there and hunt the rare bads that are terrorizing the towns? I think it's more likely to say that if you want to create a sort of dragon slaying, you may need to wrap its hilt with leather obtained from the hide of a dragon. Okay. So you will absolutely be incented to go find the toughest monsters in the world and kill them. Uh, because the stuff you get from them is going to have really high value to somebody, and maybe to you. All right. Well, we're starting to run towards the end of time. I really appreciate you coming and answering our questions about Pathfinder Online. Um, no. So, again, this will be up on the site tomorrow, so if anybody wants to rewatch it and make sure to check your answers, it will be out there for you. Uh, and make sure to keep an eye on MMORPG.com for all future and upcoming news on Pathfinder Online. So thanks for joining us, Ryan. It was great to be here. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome.